So what I want to talk to you about today is, uh, as, uh, as you said in the introduction, it's about the uh, Digital Learner Research Project that we're involved in with uh, Albert and uh, others in, uh, in the WAC eLearning Centre, uh, but with a focus on the actual methodology that we're using in that project. So I'm going to start by uh, just giving you a little bit of background on the, uh, on the research project and then talk a little bit about um, the actual uh, research questions and the, uh, the issues that we were looking at and then look in more detail at the methodology we've used so far and then the methodology that we are or the uh, sort of next steps in the, uh, in the overall project of where we're, where we're heading with the, with the research. So the, the project that we're involved in now, um, which has turned into a, really an international collaboration with WAC and with uh, another university in Canada, the University of Regina, um, really began uh, with fairly modest, sort of humble origins. It, be, it, be, it emerged out of a doctoral study, so a study that um, uh, you're going to be undertaking as part of your uh, studies, uh, um, so a similar kind of research that was being done by a doctoral student who was a colleague and a friend. And he was looking for somewhere to collect his data. Um, and he, was, he had a kind of a vague idea of what he was intending to uh, study. Um, it had something to do with communication preferences of post-secondary learners. And he wanted, uh, he wanted some institution to collect data from, so I suggested that he come to my institution, the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and uh, collect data from our students. And as we were working uh, on that and working out the details of how he was going to collect his data, we started to think about adding uh, another dimension or another um, focus to, the, to his study, uh, or specifically around the whole idea of the net generation, the digital learner, and the kind of prevailing discourse around that that, uh, that I'm sure you've all heard about. And so what we've done is essentially integrate or embed within his study some specific questions around the net generation and the, and the digital learner. So it didn't it didn't start out as it didn't start out the way it ended. Uh, it really began uh, quite differently and, and kind of e uh, evolved. So just to to um, talk a little bit about the net generation. I'm assuming that that it's uh, a term that that you're all familiar with, but I just want to clarify what what we mean when we talk about that. And it's really um, what we're talking about in terms of the, the, um, uh, the age range of that generation, um, because it varies depending on who you read, the different people uh, have a slightly different uh, um, a, a date range for that generation. We're talking really about uh, the generation born from 1980, after 1982. And really we're talking about um, not only a, a group of people who, ha who are, are of a certain age, but we're talking about a whole set of characteristics that are attributed to that generation. So it's more than just a, a label or a generational label. It's, it's really become kind of a, a, a discourse around what the characteristics are of that group of people who were born in that time period. And there's a lot that has been written about it, and a lot of what I would call what we would call hype, because um, if you actually look at, and we did this as part of our uh, background uh, literature review for this research, if you actually look at what's been written on this generation and some of the books, pop, particularly the popular literature, you find that, um, that it, it is very, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of hype, there's not a lot of hard data that goes that underlies and supports the claims that are made in most of the books that have been written on this topic. And these are just a few. There's actually uh, more, and, and, and more and more seem to be uh, coming out all the time. And uh, another one that's just about to be published by Mark Prensky, who is one of the people that we, um, we refer to quite frequently, um, is focused specifically on how to teach this generation. So he's written an entire book that purports to uh, to discuss, you know, how, how we should be teaching this generation. I haven't seen the book; it hasn't been published, so I don't know um, how good it is. So, some of the um, uh, to g just to give you an idea of, you know, what people are saying. If you haven't read any of those books, these are just a few of the quotes that come out of them. So, 
and, and they're very strong, um, strident kind of uh, claims. So things like the first one, today's students think and process information fundamentally different than their predecessors. Uh, the current model of education is not appropriate for kids who have grown up digital. So it's not just an issue of um, claiming that this generation is different in how they process information, but it goes on to, to uh, imply that we should be changing the way that we uh, teach and the way that we organize our institutions. Um, the cognitive differences of the digital natives cry out for new approaches to education with a better fit. So, um, so they, they, they really uh, make substantial claims and then go even further to make uh, recommendations for what we should be doing about those um, generational differences. So um, the idea of the net generation is very firmly entrenched in our sort of educational discourse. It's amazing to me how often I hear uh, people, educators, talk about it as though it's, it's a fact. Um, we often um, don't even uh, question it anymore. Um, I, at the moment, I'm teaching a, a graduate course in a uh, Master in Educational Technology. I'm just marking the first assignments from the students. And I'm shocked at just about every single one of them makes reference to this as though it's a fact. Um, so, you know, I guess the question is why should we really be concerned about it? And I think uh, we should be concerned about it because we should all, as educators, be, you know, questioning claims and making sure that they're based on research. But it goes beyond that because actually um, there are significant implications for these claims in terms of how institutions are organized. And major institutions are actually um, making decisions, potential decisions around inf uh, investments in, in infrastructure and how they organize their teaching based on, on these claims. We, uh, one of the questions we constantly ask ourselves is, you know, why have, have, has this discourse, how have these claims become so firmly entrenched? And we've kind of uh, um, taken to using the term the snark syndrome heard of that, but it comes out of uh, uh, a poem by Lewis Carroll called The Hunting of the Snark, and there's a, a quote there from that where basically the, uh, it's the idea that if you say something enough times, it doesn't matter how true it is, um, it becomes accept, uh, accepted as truth. And we think that's what's happened with the, uh, with the net generation uh, discourse. So... Um, I'll try to get through this quickly so I can get on the, onto the details of the, of the methodology. But if we look at the claims about the net generation, uh, we, tried, we, we, we sort of categorize them into three broad categories. There are claims about how the generation is using technology and learning technology, uh, social media technologies, uh, which is a, you know, a fairly simple, uh, basic claim. And, it's, and, and that one's fairly easy to, to, uh, to document and to, to, to find evidence of. Uh, but then when we move up uh, kind of a, to a second level, we look at the impact of those technologies and that use. And that's where the, the claims get more tenuous and more questionable. And then there's a third category around the, the characteristics of this generation. And, and that's sort of somewhat related to the second, characterist, uh, the second uh, car category. So as I said, the first level or first category of claims around technology used is, is pretty basic. And, and I don't think there's any question that um, this generation is using technology much more than previous generations and using different technologies. And there's all sorts of surveys that have been done. The Pew Research uh, Foundation in the United States does regular surveys of technology use and, and others do the same. And it, and it shows growing use of, of new and emerging technologies. But on the other hand, it also what research is also showing is that it's not just restricted to that generation. We're all using technologies more. So, so that, that category of claim is not really contentious and we're not taking issue with that. We're not suggesting that this generation is not using technology more than other generations. The second uh, category of claims is where it starts to get interesting. And this is you know, around what, what does it mean? What is the impact of that technology use? And, and this is where we get some of the more um, contentious and strident claims. And so what, 
people like uh, Mark Prensky and Don Tapscott and others are saying is that basically because this generation has been immersed, essentially immersed in this digital technology world since birth almost, that it is having fundamental, uh, fundamental impact on how they do all sorts of things in terms of how they interact with the world, how they learn, how they access information. Um, and it is, in, in some cases, they're actually making claims that it's changing the, uh, the physical structure of their brains. So there's a quote there from Prensky at the bottom uh, talking about how they think and process information fundamentally differently than, pre, uh, than their predecessors and that these differences go further and deeper than most educators suspect or realize. So a little bit more on that, that category of, of uh, claims. Um, it suggests that they not only are using the technologies more, more frequently, uh, a greater range of technologies, but they're sophisticated users. They don't just know uh, the basics, but they really know uh, how to use those technologies in a very deep way. Um, it suggests that they have a very different relationship with media, uh, with information, um, with the technology, that they think and learn differently, and then uh, ultimately that they have different expectations of, of school, uh, work, and uh, life. The third category of, car of, uh, of claims that, that uh, are out there, and, and these are quite, uh, there's a bit of an overlap with the second category, and it's really a, a, a around the idea that, the, that this whole generation has certain very specific and unique characteristics. And if you look at all that's been written about that, um, you get a, quite a long list. And this is sort of a, 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 an attempt to summarize the list of characteristics that have been attributed to that generation. And you've probably heard of many of them, the idea that they are expert multitaskers. So it's not just that they can multitask, because we all do that to some extent, but the argument is that they do it and they, know how, and they do it well and they're able to do many different things and do them all well at the same time. Um, the, uh, the idea that they need uh, immediate feedback, that they prefer teamwork and collaboration, um, that they're experiential learners, that they're very social, they're ambitious, career oriented, they have a, a real need for freedom and for customized experiences both in learning and, and in life. I could say all, uh, quite a lot about that, but I, I'll, I, I want to move on to the, uh, to the um, methodology. So what this all means and why it's so important that we, uh, we think that we examine these claims is that if we accept them, it really implies a significant change for higher education. It suggests a shift from um, a, what we call an architecture of presentation to one uh, more of participation. And there's, there's not, we don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, most um, educational institutions are moving in that direction in many ways already. Um, but we should be doing that based on evidence, not based on, on, uh, on unsubstantiated claims. But what this means, if we accept that, is that uh, we need to do much more collaborative learning. We should be using much more multimedia. There should be more interaction, more interactive learning. Um, that students expect increasingly to be entertained. Um, that they want their learning to be, to be very personalized, and there should be a lot more digital game-based learning in, uh, in our, not only higher education, but in the, uh, the, the lower levels of education. So as I said, the, the, the validity of these claims is really in question, and uh, um, they're not based on sound research. We did a, a thorough review of the literature, and what we found is that that they're not based on research, that if you look at what underlies the claims, um, a lot of it is proprietary research, so it's very hard to get at the methodology, and that's a real problem. So um, it's possible that some of the claims that are being made are based on some good research, but we have no way of knowing that because they won't release the details. Um, it's, uh, a lot of it is, or most of it is, based on sort of anecdotal uh, reflections and observations of classroom activities of professors who are relating uh, incidents or, or observations that have occurred in their class. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of research. Anecdotal research often leads us to, um, to uh, further uh, research, deeper uh, analysis of the issues that emerge. But we can't make generalizations based on anecdotal observations, and that's what's happened. 
Um, often the claims are based on speculation that's taken out of context, and quite often what we've seen is biased samples. So there are samples of learners in situations where um, the, si the, the, the context is very special or different. It's not, it's not generalizable to a larger sample. So for example, one of the, um, one of the, the, uh, uh, the studies that was done that supports the book by Neil Howe and William Strauss, Strauss um, called Millennials um, was based on surveys that was done in one school district in a very higher income uh, part of the United States. And uh, based on that, he's generalized to an entire generation. That, that's what I mean by, by a sample. Also, Don Tapscott, in a lot of his research, is collecting data from people, from students, from uh, people in this generation who are already engaged with the technology. So he'll go into online discussion forums or um, set up uh, special forums that are conducted online and collect data. And so he's already, he's dealing with, with a sample of, of uh, people who are already using the technologies and then asking them about their use of the technologies. So it's very, it's very difficult to generalize from that to the entire uh, generation. And it's not only our reviews, a review of the research that has questioned this, there are several others that have come out that also question the uh, legitimacy of some of these claims. The other thing is that a lot of the good research, the research that's actually based on, uh, that uses good methodology, is uh, tending to contradict many of the claims that are uh, made in the popular literature. Okay, um, let's move on to the, to the actual study, the, re the project that we're engaged in right now, and the methodology that we used uh, for that. Um, really, it was a, uh, a two-part study that began with a, a qualitative component, and then um, and in the <coughs> second part, there was a quantitative component. So it began by <coughs> conducting focus group interviews with um, 69 students, um, and they weren't individual students. We had them in groups of four or five. And the purpose of that was to uh, generate themes that we could then uh, turn into questions that would go on a survey that would be, would be administered to a wider uh, sample. So we interviewed 69 students. I've forgotten. I think there may have been 12 or 14 focus groups. In, in total, there were 69 students. Um, we asked them a, a range of questions about their use of technology. Um, when we were conducting the focus groups, the, the focus was not entirely on this, this theme of the net generation. It was on the, the broader question of how they were using ICTs for communication <coughs> both inside and outside the classroom. So we conducted those interviews and then analyzed the interviews and looked for the, the kind of broad themes that came out of those interviews. And out of that, constructed a survey um, that was then uh, administered to an, a random sample of students from the entire institution. And it was in that survey that we, we inserted the questions around the net generation and their use of technology and the characteristics of the net generation. And we took those out of the, the literature that we had reviewed. <coughs> it's important to emphasize that all of this is based on self-reporting of the, of the students. So it's, it's not... There's no sort of objective observation of the students and trying to determine uh, whether they fit the characteristics. We're basically asking them to tell us whether they are uh, digitally literate, whether they multitask, uh, and so on. So it's uh, entirely based on their self-reporting, their perception, self-perception. So the, the research questions that, um, that were behind the study. First of all, how accurate are some of the prevalent claims about the net generation learners? Then do the students at this particular Canadian post-secondary institu institution fit the typical profile of the net generation learner? And we were very careful to not try to generalize beyond our institution because our institution, my institution, is, is uh, not the same as this institution. It's, it's, quite, it's very different. It's very different than many of the other post-secondary institutions in Canada. So the profile of our learners is quite different in, in many respects. And then the final question, how are the learners at this institution using various information and communication technologies? That was the, the broad question that, that, un, that was underlying the, the study to begin with. And, uh, and we added the, uh, the net generation related questions to that. 
So in terms of the, the, the specifics of the survey creation, it was done in a, in a three-step process. First of all, a question inventory was, was created, and that came out of the themes that emerged from the focus group interviews. Uh, those questions were then reviewed for content validity by a number of uh, people who we considered sort of experts in the field. So we asked them to look at the questions and, and tell us uh, whether they made sense. And then ba th there were some revisions based on that feedback. And then a pilot test of the survey was administered to a group of students um, to um, ensure that it was usable, that it was getting the results that we wanted it to get. And we then made some more revisions based on that. And then the, um, the questions around the net generation, as I said, were, were taken, were synthesized from the, uh, from the review of the literature. And those were, that's how those got into the survey. So the, the survey had, uh, the, the questions around the net generation are really a subset of a larger survey that was looking at communication preferences. And I have to keep um, emphasizing that because we tend to focus entirely on the net generation as part of this survey. Part, only one part of the larger survey. So the characteristics that we used to <coughs> create the questions that went into the survey, um, this, is, this is the list that we had synthesized from the literature. Um, the notion of, the, of this generation being digitally literate, literate being connected, constantly connected, multitasking, um, a preference for experiential learning, preference for group work or teamwork, preference for images over text, um, a need for structure in learning, uh, the idea that they're uh, very social, that they're community-minded, and they're goal-oriented. So these all came come out of the literature, and what we tried to do was uh, create some questions, some, some items in the survey that uh, got at these characteristics. So there were four sections to the survey. The first section um, was really just biographical and demographic information. And it was the sections two through four which really get at the, the issues that we were trying to, um, trying to identify. So section two was the behavioral items about what the students do, do to address administrative and academic questions. So this, this is really about what kinds of, uh, of uh, ICTs they use, who they go to for help. This section two was really not related to, to our um, part of the study in terms of the net generation. It was section, the sections three and four that are the most relevant. Uh, so section three had behavioral items about student communication habits, including use of ICTs. And then section four had attitudinal items about students' study preferences, perceptions of peers, instructors, and their programs. And so within really section three and four is where we embedded our questions about the that generation. I think there, there may have been one or two in, the, in section two, but mostly sections three and four. Um, getting even more specific, we used a four-point Likert scale. Uh, we did that deliberately because we were trying to, uh, I guess, force, we didn't want to give them the opportunity to say, you know, um, not re or, or, you know, um, have a midpoint where they could, they weren't forced to say yes or no or by having a four-point scale, it kind of tends to force them to make, uh, make decisions. So section, uh, in section two, the scale was defined in terms of the relative frequency of use, where number one equaled never, and then number four, always. So you can see there's no opportunity to sort of sit on the fence. Um, in section three, usage was specified in terms of the number of times a, a particular technology was used per per month, and so zero would be, or never was equivalent to uh, the, the, uh, zero times per month and all the way up to always, which was more than 10 times per month. And in section four, the scale ranged from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So in terms of how we actually got our sample, what we did is we got an, uh, an entire list of the courses that are offered at our institution and then randomly chose 16 courses, uh, sent the instructors of those courses uh, an email asking them if we could come to their class 
and administer, administer the survey in class, a paper-based survey. We decided to use a paper-based survey because we were told by our um, research office at the BCIT, inst Institutional Research Office, who, and that's a group that does all the institutional surveys around um, student um, satisfaction and student outcomes. Um, their experience was that by using paper-based surveys, they get a much higher response rate than when they do online surveys. It's much easier to do an online survey. You can just send out an email and, and you can, uh, you know, the data is there online, but what they found is the, the response rate is not as high. And so we went to the classrooms, these courses, and administered the, the paper-based survey. Um, it was a little bit more difficult than that because uh, not all the instructors responded, and so we had to send a follow-up email and then um, identify 11 more courses and again, not all of them responded. But in the end, we got, uh, we got 16 courses and we got uh, over 400 students. But we have to go to each one of those classes and at the beginning of the class, hand out the survey, give them 10 minutes to complete it and then collect it. So it was a bit, a bit time consuming, but um, uh, gave us higher returns. In terms of the, how we analyze the survey data, um, we used both a MANOVA and a Man whitney test, and uh, I hope you don't ask me any questions about this because I don't know the details of this, this kind of statistical procedure. Um, the uh, doctoral student that was uh, uh, doing the study was the, uh, our statistical expert, and he knows this stuff inside out. But the reason those two tests were used was that in one case, so for MANOVA, uh, to test for sig significance, it was used when generation was the independent variable and generational char characteristics were the dependent variable. Um, and then in the other case, the Mann-Whitney test was used because um, we had the issue of ordinal versus interval um, variables. And apparently, um, MANOVA doesn't work with that, but Mann-Whitney does. So we're getting into some, some uh, um, statistical testing kind of differences. And then getting even more um, detailed here, SPSS, which is the uh, statistical package that we're using, doesn't calculate effect size for that kind of test, so we have to uh, convert the Z-score into an R, and that was the formula that was used to do that. These are the kind of details that you can't get about a lot of the research that's been done on the net generation. They don't provide that kind of methodological detail, so you have no way of assessing its, its quality. So looking at, at the results that we got, and what, one of the things that we were doing, and I didn't, I didn't explain this, is that we, we got the data back from the survey, and then we, we wanted to compare the, the, the net generation portion <coughs> of the sample with the non-net generation, so we, we broke the we, we, the sample up into two, into two uh, groups, those who were in the net generation age and those who were not. And we, and we did a comparison, a statistical comparison, to see if there was any significant difference in how they were responding to the different items. And the interesting thing is what we found, basically, was that there was no difference. Um, if we look at each one of these items in terms of um, their uh, level, first of all, the, the level of agreement is the, the level uh, or the uh, degree to which the, uh, s the uh, respondents agreed with the item, regardless of their age. So in terms of being di digitally literate, overall, the sample said yes. They, were, they, they, were very, they rated that very highly in terms of their own digital literacy. But if you compare the net generation portion of the sample, those eight, uh, born after 1982, with the non-net generation, there was no significant, significant difference. So basically, they were all they, were, they all felt they were digitally literate. Um, the other ones on that list that are moderately high in terms of agreement: connected, multitasking, experiential learning, and structured learning. Again, everybody tended to rate that one fairly high. There were small relationships, statistical relationships between generation, but so small that, that they're not worth uh, even mentioning. Yes. Sorry, uh, maybe I, I didn't understood, I understand what you said, but uh, 
uh, where is the other group that you mentioned, which is not the net generation? Those, what, where are they, or who are they? Yeah, well, uh, did you they mention the sample of the this group? We, we, the, we, the sample was about 442 students. But from the net generation? No. Okay. That was just taken from the, institu from the institution in general, regardless of age. And then within that, we separated out the net generation age students from the non-net generation and compared the two. So within that 442, I don't have the actual But these numbers. ones were, uh, the 1,442, um, were some that uh, born after the yeah. 1992 and some others that don't? Yeah. So the, the four in that sample, there were students uh, a range of ages from 18 to 50. I, can't, I don't forgotten the total range. but So there's a whole range of ages within that group. Split it into two. But not a very high difference because in a post secondary institution, most of the, the students that are right now are more quite close to the next yeah. generation. Yeah, right? although we have, um, be because our institution is different, uh, we have a lot of, we have more older students okay. than you might find in a, in a okay, typical okay. university. Okay. And, I, and I'm sorry, I, I, I can probably find the actual. No, no, numbers. because I didn't understand. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, the a, it's an important question groups. because. Um, you need to know yeah. what the, the number in each in each sample was, uh, and I and I don't I didn't bring okay, that with okay. me, but I can probably find it. Okay. But yeah, so we we split it into two and then compared. Okay, thank you. So um, <coughs> so in, in the cases where we did find a small relationship, as I said, the the relationship was, you know, statistically there was a relationship, but uh, it's so small that you can't really make any, any valid claims based on that. So for all intents and purposes, there were no significant differences between net generation and non-net generation um, a lot of those uh, those characteristics or those items um, if you look at group work the level of agreement for that very low so nobody likes group work um, small relationship in terms of significance but nothing that can be really uh, said to be meaningful um, social, uh, the, degree, the degree to which they agreed with the, the notion that they are social, uh, moderately high. But again, that was across the board. Uh, Goal-oriented, preference for text, community-minded, sort of a moderate agreement with that. But, but fundamentally, what the, the overall message is, is that there's really no difference between the two uh, generate, or the net generation and not non When we looked at how they were, you know, the technologies that they were actually using to communicate with their peers, um, what we found again is really not a, not a significant difference between net generation and not generation. So the modes that we asked them about, the modes of communication were BCIT email, so that's the institutional email address they have, personal email, instant messaging, uh, text messaging, uh, the use of Facebook or MySpace, talking on the phone. Uh, talking in person and WebCT, which at that time was the learning management system that we were using. The interesting thing about those results is that the highest uh, uh, mode was talking um, in person. So they, they really, um, you know, the, the notion that, they, that they're sort of uh, immersed in technology and always want to use technology to communicate really doesn't, uh, isn't very valid. They, they really, their first choice, their highest preference is talking in person. But if you look at all of them across the board, there's, there's really not a significant difference between uh, how the two groups were, uh, were communicating with their peers. Actually, if you look at the, the second highest, it's talking on the phone. So we've got talking in person, which is, doesn't involve any technology, and then talking on the phone, which is invo involves a, you know, a very old uh, technology. In terms of how they communicate with instructors, again, the uh, highest rate it is talking in person. Um, so if you look at some of the, um, the newer technologies, the social media technologies, um, or things like instant messaging, there really was not a very strong preference for using those to communicate with instructors. And actually, when we, when in, in the face-to-face -face, uh, focus group interviews, when we were talking to them, we got the very distinct impression, and it's a, a, a something we want to explore further, that 
they they really had a uh, a sense that there were certain certain ways of communicating with the instructors and certain ways of communicating communicating with their peers, and that they, for instance, instant messaging, they almost when we asked them about using that to communicate with the instructors, they, they, they kind of backed off of it and said, well, that would be crazy because they felt that that was something that was kind of a very social um, method of communicating with their peers that, that just wouldn't make any sense to use to communicate with their instructors. It, was getting too, it would be getting too close to their instructors to use instant messaging as a way to communicate. So they, had a very, they seemed to have a very clear idea that certain technologies were useful for certain purposes in terms of communication and certain other ones were useful uh, for other types of communication. Again, that tends to contradict the notion that, um, that the technologies that are being used are being used across the board regardless of, of their purpose. So our conclusions that, that we've come to so far, and this is really just the first phase of this study, <coughs> but so far what we've come concluded out of that uh, survey is that at, at our institute, at BCIT, is that students have a, a basic level of comfort with many ICTs, but that this is not related to generation. So what we found, in, in, and when we looked at both the survey data and the interview data that we did, we, we concluded that they, they work with kind of a limited toolkit of technologies, and their use of those technologies is driven by things like their, their ubiquity, the, the, the uh, degree to which they allow them, we call it self-organizing capabilities, which is really the idea that they are technologies that, are, that allow them to customize those technologies to their own use. So they're not, uh, there was a, tended to be some resistance to using institutional tools because the institutional tools weren't flexible and weren't easy to use. So they would prefer to use things like MSN or uh, Google, um, apps because they were uh, easy to use and they were uh, customizable rather than using the, the learning management system that the institution had or using the institutional email. Um, the other thing we found was that often the, the kind of basics of the infrastructure that was provided by the institution, the program specific technologies, so whether they had lab equipment, that kind of thing, uh, and software that was needed, a very specific software that was needed to their programs was, was often something that they talked about more and seemed, seemed to be more valued than kind of the broad uh, uh, social media and uh, communication technologies that tend to be the focus of, of, of a lot of this discussion about the net generation. Um, we, we were quite interested in the conclusion or the, the data that came out about group work and the fact that they uh, Regardless of their age, they didn't. That wasn't very, uh, very highly preferred. And um, again, that's another thing we want to explore a bit further. But our our sense is that the reason that group work was not that highly preferred in, in at our institution is that the it's a very the programs are very competitive in in uh, nature, and students spend a lot of time on campus working face to face. And uh, we got the sense that they felt that the that unless the group work was very um, specific and targeted for a very specific purpose that helped them to accomplish some goal in their course, they just found it, uh, it, it was not, not worthwhile and that was one of the reasons that they, uh, that they tended not to favor it. So, that, so there has to be a, a strong motivation to work in a group. It, it shouldn't be something that's just done for the sake of doing it. And I think that uh, that may have been a problem uh, in some of the courses in our institution. Some of the broader conclusions that we've come to is uh, really what, what we need to be doing is um, basic, sort of what you do in basic instructional design, asking the right questions. We shouldn't be making decisions about technology use based on some generalized discussion out there or some discourse out there that, that, that uh, suggests that, that all learners are of that age range are exactly the same, have exactly the same needs. We need to be looking at our learners and trying to figure out what they need. And that's going to vary uh, from uh, institution to institution and from even within an institution there's going to be differences between the programs that they're in and their needs. Um, the other uh, really important uh, 
thing that's come out of this so far is that there is there's clearly a difference between social use of technology, at least we think there is, between how technologies are being used for social purposes and how they're being for edu being used for educational purposes. And the problem we have with a lot of the the hype and the claims that are made about this generation is it tends to to uh, to ignore those differences and assume that if if students are using social media technologies, um, using Facebook and Twitter and so on, that, that they, they there's, there's, a, there's sort of a, an automatic um, desire to use those in an educational context. And we, we think, and one of the things that we're going to be doing in the next phase of the study is looking more deeply into that distinction. Um, the other thing is that we conclude is that we as educators need to be a lot more critical of the research, or not even research, but of the the claims that are made about about this, uh, or about anything, but particular about this, uh, about this, um, about this area. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we we've tended to accept uh, these claims without a lot of criticism, without a lot of examination of the underlying research. It also points out the value of academic research. A lot of the claims that are made around the net generation come out of um, out of research that is not conducted within an academic context, so it doesn't undergo the same kind of peer review process. It doesn't have the same requirements for transparency and, and uh, disclosure of methodology. And so we as, as educators have no way of really assessing its, its quality. And then finally, we need to differentiate between generational differences and social change. What, what we found so far in the, in the research that we've done is that the characteristics that have been attributed to this generation really often apply to, to everybody. They're not just generational issues, they're social issues. We're all uh, being affected by the change in technologies, by the, the ubiquity of technology and the internet. And uh, we need to really clarify uh, that issue and understand that it's not necessarily a generational issue, it's a social issue. So finally, uh, generation so far from what we've been, to, been able to determine does not explain technology use or learning preferences. Um, it's really about the context, um, what the students are studying, where they are studying, who they are. And the decision making that we make needs to be based on those needs, not on, on some generalized notion of a generation. So the next steps in this uh, project, well, as I said at the outset, this, this began with modest beginnings as a small uh, bit of research that was being conducted by one doctoral student has turned into now really an international collaboration with WAC and with the University of Regina. And what we're doing uh, with that is that we're um, moving into a second phase. So the first phase is really to try to get a sense of who the learners are in those three institutions and how they're using technologies. So each of those institutions is going to or has administered that similar survey to get a kind of base, baseline understanding. The second uh, phase of the research is to look more deeply at some of the issues that have come out of that, re, uh, out of that data, so focus on how the technologies are being used, uh, look at the distinction between educational versus social use, look at some of the implications for that, what does it mean for those institutions and how they, uh, the kinds of technologies they use and how they design the programs. And all of this is being uh, informed by activity theory, uh, which is really, and we could spend the whole uh, afternoon talking about activity theory, but uh, fundamentally it's about, it's about the idea that the things that we do depend intimately on the context in which they're done. And, uh, and we're using that, uh, that theory to kind of guide the, um, the exploration in the next phase of the study. For more information on this, you can go to our uh, research website, which is on the right, which is digitallearners.ca. What we're trying to do with this uh, project is, as quickly as possible, make our data, our methodology, our survey instruments, everything available on this website so, it, so our whole process is transparent and available for others to use and to replicate. And we're actually, a lot of what we're doing so far has been based on what others have done. So there's uh, a research group in uh, Australia that has produced a lot of uh, valuable data and uh, we're, using, we're, we're basing a lot of our 
um, both <laughs> survey and design and so on on the work that they've done. There's also a group in, uh, in the UK at the Open University who are doing similar things. And so we're trying to connect with other groups that are doing the same kind of research and trying to build on each other's uh, work. And then on the left, there's a blog that I maintain called NetGen Skeptic. And in that, um, what I try to do is just post uh, the most recent um, research or publications or um, uh, discussions around this issue and uh, just keep a running. It, it's actually a very good resource because I, I often go back to it myself because I remember that something was published at some point in the last couple of years and I can do a search of that blog and find a, a reference to it and, and it, there's a, you know, a, a short write-up summarizes it so it's a it's a good that's a good resource and those are just some references so that's it I'll stop